Okay, so we've got this picture about light at the moment, that light has an energy given by E equals HF, comes in bundles of energy. We've also got this idea that the wavelength of light would be H over its momentum. Okay, now that shows you that light has both a wave property because it's got a wavelength and a particle property because it's got a momentum. All right, and that's a constant number there. Now what this also shows is that electromagnetic waves that have a larger wavelength, so radio waves, will show wave properties better, so you better diffract them, show interference and so on. And they'll have a very small momentum, so you wouldn't be able to use them to knock electrons out of a piece of gold foil or whatever else. Now if you look at the other end of the spectrum, like the gamma rays there, they've actually got a much, much, much smaller wavelength, so it's impossible really to show their wave properties in terms of interference and diffraction. Now they've got a much bigger momentum because obviously these two multiplied together have to equal a constant. So as this one goes down, the momentum has to go up and therefore it's going to have a much bigger momentum property and it's going to cause ionisation a lot better if it does strike an electron, it can knock it out and give it a lot of momentum and transfer a lot of momentum. So you just remember this can have a very small wave property and a large particle property or vice versa. The one that probably has a good balance of the two of them is X-rays. You can actually show wave properties with X-rays and momentum properties with X-rays. It's ideal for that. So if you pass X-rays through a crystal, you can show an interference pattern and get rings in actual fact on a screen as it goes through a crystal or reflects off a crystal. And that's evidence of interference because you're getting your first order spectrum there. Sorry, you're getting your zero order spectrum there. You're getting your first order spectrum and so on. And you can use the D sine theta formula to back that up that X-rays are showing wave interference there. But not only that, you can actually fire X-rays at something and cause particles to be released or fired out the other side. So it does have momentum. So that's the best combination. Now, this is what they knew about light then, this, this wave particle property of light, or duality of light, the dual properties of the two of them. Now what De Brody did, he said, is uh, if light has both wave and particle properties, or momentum properties there, perhaps all matter had wave properties as well as momentum properties. So if you rearrange the formula that they're using for light, he said we could actually work out the wavelengths of objects by doing H over MV. Okay, so if you consider a person running at maybe... 10 metres per second, and let's give a mass of 100 to make it nice and easy. What sort of wavelength would they be looking at? And if you look at that there, it would be by 10 to the minus 31. And that's a very, very small wavelength. You could not show wave properties by that because to actually show diffraction and interference, you would need a slit similar sort of order to that one. Okay, So that's not going to be possible there. So what's the smallest matter we could test this idea with? So if you think of it, we'd use an electron. Okay, so to test this out, what you would do here is you could try a typical electron going at slow speed because if it's got slow speed, it's going to have low momentum and have a much bigger part wavelength property to show it. So let's try these with slow moving electrons. So one of the experiments that was done was by Geiger and Marsden. So what you would do is you'd fire electrons through an electron gun at low voltage. So we use a filament there. We'd actually have some sort of potential difference going to a slit. Okay. A bit rough there and we put a potential difference through here of maybe only 54 volts they should play around with this voltage a lot and this is the one they came up with to use so 54 volts so based on that then you get electrons coming through here they'll be accelerated in this region here and given 54 electron volts of energy okay so that when they come through they're actually going to have that much as kinetic energy so what we're going to do is fire this as a target a nickel target it's actually a nickel crystal target there and we're going to fire it like that at the target. So the electrons are going to come off that crystal and be scattered in lots of directions there. And what we're looking for is where to get the maximum uh, electron scattering there. And when they graphed it, they found out that you get your best sort of scattering at an angle of about 50 degrees from memory. That was about a 50 degree angle there. You got your peak always at 50 degrees. Now to detect that, they had a detector on their arm there that was free to rotate along that path there, so there was a detector. And that would measure a current as the electrons hit it. So they moved that around and that's where they found out that 50 degrees is where this peak occurred for the actual uh, diffraction of the electrons there. Now this is pretty good evidence that uh, electrons behave like waves because it actually was showing a maximum and a minimum even. And there was a definite maximum. This was surely showing that matter waves could be a possibility. Now if you check it then, there's a formula here that you can use for this angle, where this is theta. And you can still use d sine theta equals m lambda if it's behaving like a wave property. Okay? And this is your first order, m equals 1. So you can work out the wavelength, so be wavelength equals uh, d sine theta if you know what the distance between the crystals were.
So if you know what the distance between the crystals were, you can actually work out what the wavelength should be based on this sort of property here. So the wavelength was, uh, so it's 2.15 by 10 to minus 10 metres, the distance between the atoms. So the atoms are going to behave like slits there and diffract them, allow them to overlap and cause interference. So if you can sort of picture the atoms there, you've got distance between the atoms there that they knew and you're getting that sort of diffraction back off those slits. They're overlapping there and you're going to get an interference pattern. The distance between the slits was known to be 2.15 by 10 to minus 10. If you put your sine of 50 in there, you can get a predicted wavelength for this sort of wave behaviour that's going on. And that was 0 0.165 nanometers. Hopefully that would support de Broglie's idea of wavelength equals h over mv. So if you checked it, so if he's using 54 volts, then as a potential difference in this experiment, According to de Broglie, you're going to have a kinetic energy there of 54 electron volts. So the speed of the electrons would be the square root of 2k on n. And you're going to do 2 times by the kinetic energy, which is 54. Get it into joules. And it's the mass in electron, OK? 9.11 by 10 minus 31. So we know for a fact that the actual speed of these electrons should be about 4.36 by 10 to, the one, 10 to the 6 metres per second. So if you substitute that into this one of de Broglie's now, what we're going to get is Planck's constant, mass of the electron, and the velocity of the electron. And what they got from that was one, uh, 0.167 nanometers. So this is what de Broglie is saying this sort of speed electron should have and what we've got from the experiment is not 0.167, but it's actually 0.165. So looking at those two numbers there, this was excellent support and excellent evidence that electrons and matter could travel as a wave. Because what you've got this here, 0.165 nanometers from the experiment we had there, and don't forget there'll be some systematic errors in there, or random errors in there at least. So that's a pretty good result, but it might have slight uh, deviation either way. That was compared to his value of 0.167. So Geiger and Mars' experiment off the nickel crystal here with low speed electrons, low energy electrons, showed very well that this wave interference thing that was going on did agree with de Broglie's idea. Okay? Now that meant that further on down the track a whole branch of this quantum nature of matter opened up for electrons. So electrons are known to go around in shells and what de Broglie was saying was that they actually travelled as a wave. So this first orbit that was stable, stable actually had a circumference that was equal to one wavelength for a hydrogen atom. Okay? The second stable one had a circumference that was equal to two wavelengths because it didn't travel as a straight line here, it was a straight circle. So what was actually happening for these orbits is the way that the electron was travelling more like this rather than as a straight circle. Okay? So that's the introduction of that. Thank you.